Amazing. Uh, all the best to both teams. I'd like to welcome the first proposition speaker to begin the debate, Yeah, yeah. Hi, um, I'd prefer POIs in the chat, please. And my pronouns are she, her. All around the world, polarization is reaching a boiling point. In the United States, a mob stormed the Capitol in an effort to overturn a stolen election. Pakistan issued a nuclear warning to Israel after a misleading news segment that claimed that Israel had threatened them with a nuclear attack. During the pandemic, the media fueled non-compliance with protective measures all across the globe because refusing to get a vaccine or wearing a mask became a political stance. We tell you to limit polarization, we must implement a fairness doctrine. Before I move into my framing, we have a three-part model we want to push. Firstly, a fairness doctrine requires two things. A, that when covering any controversial topic, broadcasters must report both sides of the story. B, they must report both sides fairly, so broadcasters are not allowed to, for instance, discredit or otherwise undermine one side. In practice, this looks like in Italy, where talk shows regularly host debates in which they invite speakers from the two major political parties. Note that Italy has implemented a fairness doctrine recently, and partisan partisan partisanship in the media landscape has significantly decreased. The second part of our model is that broadcasters that do not comply will face a range of repercussions, ranging from a warning or a fine to even losing your permit in cases of repeated grave offenses. To avoid repercussions, we believe that broadcasters will want to comply. The last part of our model is that the fairness doctrine extends to all broadcast media. So this includes television, radio, YouTube, podcasts, but even on social media, such as the BBC on Instagram or the New York Times on Facebook. Okay, three points of framing I want to push before we get into our substantive. Firstly, note that the fairness doctrine is merely an extension of existing broadcast regulation. So for instance, we already have regulations on defamation, which are implemented so that the public is properly informed. Secondly, for some audiences, it may take some time to get used to both sides journalism. However, we think that in the long run, a fairness doctrine will become the new normal. So in other words, in our world, audiences will accept both sides journalism because they will be less polarized to begin with. But the third point of our faming is that people are not born with extreme opinions. We tell you they are socialized into them. Strong beliefs are shaped to a big degree by the media, which constantly reaffirms your tendencies to radicalize. Okay, moving on to our substantive on why we think that the fairness doctrine can combat polarization. Firstly, why do we think that the media tends towards polarization without government regulation? We tell you this for three reasons. Firstly, to draw people's attention. In the digital age, information is extremely saturated. What this means is that there are constant grabs for your attention, whether that is in social media or the news. And to grab your attention, broadcast media have to report in a polarizing way because that is what people are drawn to. We like drama, we like controversy. The second reason as to why you naturally polarization is because of competition. In the digital age, the number of broadcasters has exploded. This means that broadcasters face increasingly intense competition. To beat that competition, they start using toxic reporting strategies. During the start of the pandemic in India, we had a lot of Islamophobic voices in the media that continuously promoted conspiracy theories that Muslims were intentionally spreading COVID. Thus, you see that competition creates a race to the bottom where broadcasters increasingly turn to inflammatory reporting. The third reason is because of a self-reinforcing cycle. Note that once the media polarizes is its audience, the audience will in turn demand more polarizing coverage. So this looks like in Mexico, where opposition voters consume media that tells them what they want to hear, namely that the current president is deliberately trying to tear down Mexican society and undermine their economy. Note that this only makes them more certain in their beliefs. What this all proves is that polarization is inherent to an unregulated media landscape. This, that is why we see it all over the globe. Before I move on, I'll take a POI. Note how those people who engage in conspiracy theory sort of thinking already have predisposed notions about the state and its involvement through theories like the deep state, QAnon, etc. How do you address this issue while you're furthering state involvement in how information is being decimated to such people? 
Okay, later on in my speech, I'm also going to analyze, analyze to you why on opposition side of the house, you're more likely to have people go to unreliable sources such as such as 4chan, such as for instance, Twitter. Okay, moving on. Why do we think that polar, a polarizing media landscape is detrimental to society? We tell you a unique characterized a characteristic of polarizing media is that all political opponents are framed as the explicit enemy. This harms political discussion in three ways. Firstly, through increased hostility, because hostile behaviors become legitimate when you think of the other side as evil. This looks like protesters abusing those visiting abortion clinics in Poland. Secondly, we tell you this creates a political gridlock because legislators of different parties are unwilling to cooperate because you see the other side as the enemy. This occurs even when there is substantive overlap in their viewpoints. This looks like Republicans blocking a Democratic bill to subsidize baby formula, even though previously they proposed the exact same policy. The last part of this is democratic backsliding. The reason that democracies survive is not because there are legal processes that make authoritarian moves impossible. Rather, it is because we have soft democratic norms that are respected. For instance, you accept election results or you don't engage in gerrymandering. Note that when the other side is the enemy, you're far more likely to break the, the, these norms. This looks like Republicans refusing to let Democrats appoint Supreme Court justices, for instance. What is the comparative then? We tell you implementing a fairness doctrine decreases polarization in three ways. Firstly, through normalization. When you get more exposure to the other side, you're more likely to accept that view as normal. So in the 2022 study, Fox News viewers were paid to watch CNN. And after this experiment, their stance of political issues changed. For example, many participants started to believe that Fox News actually concealed negative information about Donald Trump. The second way in the fairness in how the fairness doctrine can change things is through moderation. As explained, the fairness doctrine requires broadcasters to give a platform to viewpoints of the other side. We don't think broadcasters will want to give a voice to threatening viewpoints. So what's more likely to happen is they will invite moderates. So for example, rather than Fox News constantly pointing to a far left politician like AOC, as a representative of the Democratic Party, they're more likely to invite someone like Joe Manchin, who is far more restrained. The third way in which we change things is through humanization. We tell you speakers are more likely to emphasize commonalities when they know their audience is less respective to their ideas. So if you're going on Fox News and you know that people are probably going to be very apprehensive to what, you're, what you have to say, you're more likely to try to convince them by finding things you have in common. The impact of this is as follows. Firstly, those on the far end of the spectrum are more likely to moderate their opinion. But secondly, even if they don't moderate their opinion, they will moderate their view of the other side. Because when you have seen their humanity, when you've heard their explanations, even though you disagree with their conclusions, at least you see them as human, as having pure, not evil motives. Note that a decrease in polarization has an additional benefit. You decrease consumption of untrustworthy media like Twitter, Breitbart, and 4chan. This is a direct response to the POI. And this is for two reasons. Firstly, through polarized tradition, because polarized traditional media are a gateway into untrustworthy media sources. So in other words, the jump between Fox News and Breitbart is smaller when Fox News reporting is blatantly unfair. When you hold these strongly biased and dehumanized views of all Democrats, you're more likely to believe in Q on a conspiracy theory that states that a group of pedophiles is conspiring against Donald Trump. The second reason why you have more consumption of untrustworthy media on their side is that you become polarized by the media, so you demand more extreme content to fill that artificial desire. We tell you all along, we're able to break that cycle. We're able to create an audience that is less polarized. I am so proud to propose. I'd like to thank the first proposition speaker for that speech. And now to begin the case for the opposition, welcome the top O one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I'd like my POIs audibly and I'll begin in a few seconds. Panel, platforming homophobes, fascists, and casual racists will not suddenly rid them or the nation of bigotry. It will only legitimize their existence. Show them on the big screen and you encourage thousands of others to think that their views are justified. No panel, no to fascism, no to bigotry. Very proud to oppose. 
three arguments on our case. Firstly, why does the Fairness Doctrine reduce accountability on media platforms? Second, how does the Fairness Doctrine induce radicalization? And third, how are minorities let, left out from the public debate? But first of all, four points of framing before I move in into rebuttal and the arguments. First, we posit that since radical ideology is diametrically opposed to centrist narratives, attacking them with centrist ideas and facts will not make them change. Second, insofar as bad media outlets exist on both sides of the house, we prefer a few large legacy media channels which are moderately self-regulating rather than a bunch of small news entities which have no incentives for accountability. Third, this debate therefore orbits around people who are undecided or are willing to change their political preferences and ideological alignment. This looks like a working class mother seeking higher childcare subsidies, having to decide between a progressive party and a conservative counterpart. Both parties share the same goal of increased maternity you support, right? But extracted from two different worldviews. And having her priority met, the mother is willing to make an informed decision on who represents her best. And fourthly, we think that polarization is inevitable, and we're actually happy to support the fact that under increased partisan friction, news outlets of different okay. political stances keep each other accountable. We ultimately stand for the status quo. But now, a couple of points of rebuttal. Firstly, on feasibility. Secondly, on practical. Firstly, let's like, characterize how broadcasting news actually works. They were very shallow and this panel. Panel, they say that polarization is the biggest issue in society, but notice how polarization comes from the mistrust of the government. Think of the massive lack of trust in states' coverage of the coronavirus, and especially the lack of trust in like, governmental narratives and fact checkers. This pushes people to be anti-establishment and to like be on the outskirts of society. And like we don't understand on their side of the house, who decides what is fair, right? Parties change. We don't understand how having more government intervention into media is good for polarization. We think it makes people more radical, right? And they never even answered our POI on the deep and state involvement. It is clear to us that they have no explanation for why people do not become more polarized on their side of the house. But secondly, in any other state that's not the US and pluris democracies with multiple parties, the fairness doctrine would mean representing like views of seven party representatives, like their own example in Italy, right? Not two, like in the US. We posit broadcasters will have to change their whole airtime for this, right? Even if debates can actually happen on their side of the house, and proposition will explain all of the unanalyzed issues on their side. We tell you that their world's reporting is going to be bias, like a biased Fox News reporter asking guests provocative biased questions would sway the answers to a certain side rather than actually informing viewers about the issue objectively. But they also have agency to like choose what kind of guests they want to invite. They will not choose the most radical leftist. They will choose Democrats that vote Republican in the Senate like Joe Manchin. They literally concede with us that their fairness will be some tokenistic view of objectivity. Fox News on their side will look like two right-wing people instead of one. We see no impact, right? But they're also, their whole analysis like stems on the idea yeah. that people will actually watch these news. We think that debates are boring, people need something sensational, and they only get that on our side of the house, right? So now moving into the first argument, why does the Fairness Doctrine reduce accountability of media platforms? The thesis is, panel, that by allowing all views to actually be debated, broadcasters make, views, make viewers more confused and less likely to call out bigoted ideas. It is fair for us to presume that the Fairness Doctrine seeks to educate viewers to make the most informed decisions. So let's analyze why it does the opposite on their side of the house. We tell you that the fairness doctrine establishes that all angles can be true, meaning news channels can no longer ridicule one side for being blatantly false. With this two mechanisms, how illiberal views get more legitimization. Firstly, legitimization via normalization. There's a positive societal censorship like and pressure against platforming transphobic people like J.K. Rowling or the anti-Semitism of Mel Gibson, right? What happens under a proposition is that these news media are literally legally mandated to give these people an outlet and thus expose the victims to more abuse while encouraging the spread of these ideas. But secondly, legitimization via the perception of infallibility. Undertaking the most charitable characterization of the average news viewer for proposition, that is one that retains a perfect attention span during a fair but lengthy political debate and is unbiased, we posit that they're far more likely to accept and retain conservative ideas under proposition. This is because Fox has vast incentives 
plaintiffs to fulfill the fairness doctrine by inviting Republicans and pseudo-Republicans like Manchin to debate political issues. This is bad, as the fairness doctrine transforms news media outlets into marketplaces of ideas. This ultimately means that under proposition, the unbiased and engaged viewer concludes that climate change is unnecessary upon listening to two right-leaning opponents, thinking that they've heard it all they need. Under our side of the house, that same viewer knows that what they saw was a news broadcast from a singular source and is motivated to actually investigate why climate change might actually like be needed. Before moving into second, I can take that point. Go. Polar, look, you say polarization may be somewhat natural, but don't you think the media at least plays some role in enhancing the level of polarization where you can't even have proper discussion? Yeah, I already talked about this in like the first minute of my speech panel. We think that polarization comes from the involvement of the government in the media, from controlling the media. It makes people mistrust the government and the media and it makes society polarized. That doesn't happen on our side of the house. We support the status quo. Moving into the second argument, how does the fairness doctrine induce radicalization? The thesis is that radicalism often believes anti-state narratives and therefore introducing more state control will only perpetuate the cycle. I'll explain this to a proposition very clearly, right? Let's characterize radical beliefs. They see any regulations and state body interference as like hugely limiting. I already talked about this in my rebuttal, right? But they also have differing ideas from like the mainstream, which essentially ensures that the only consume media that caters to them. Think of like right-wing leaning far-right voters still watching things uh, things like Le Figaro in France or reading The Sun in the UK, right? So what happens to these people under proposition? First, as it's likely that previously your favorite channel like Fox, like Newsmax, like OAN no longer portrays your ideas channel, you feel fundamentally isolated. And second, since these people are already paranoid about state propaganda and like brainwashing, they're unlikely to even turn on any type of broadcaster that is state approved. Approved. This leads to you searching for more radical alternative news that further entrench you in the process of radicalization. Think of alternative for Deutschland supporters in Germany turning to online forums like Heise or unregulated sites like the Telegram when the idea of fact-checking was actually firstly introduced in the Reichstag, right? The comparative difference on both sides of the house is that firstly, media with significant audience reach still has to like stay face and appear rational on our side. And that is the reason why the Sun in the UK doesn't call for direct violence against Muslims. Second, we will be the first to concede that Fox News does run some controversial and occasionally pretty harmful content, but it is still incentivized to appeal to the general conservative population and especially attract young voters. Think of Fox News hosts like lesbian Tommy Bruce or Brian Lennis, a Latino LGBT activist hosting their new segments. Proposition may say this is tokenism, but we posit it has a net, net benefit, right? As Fox News exists, as the radicals or radical leanings continue to watch it, they're slowly being de-radicalized and de-bigoted. Look, we're not claiming that right-wingers will be like all loving and progressive, but the comparative is very simple panel. On our side, sure, they may support the baker not making a gay couple a wedding cake, but they no longer support just burning gay people on stakes. And for all of these reasons, they're proud to oppose. I thank the O1 for that speech. Now to continue the prop case, welcome the second prop speaker. Yeah, yeah. Hi, am I audible? Yes, all is good. Great. I would like PYs in the chat, please. And without further ado, I will start my speech. Panel, why do people become conspiracy theorists in the first place? You become a conspiracy theorist and radicalize the far right or the far left or whatever, the moment in time in which you get so ingra ingrained in a one certain way of thinking about things that you lose touch with reality. So for instance, when you only watch Fox News and you get to the point where you believe that the election was stolen, that the Democrats are conspiring to kill babies and those kinds of things, there's not too much of a logical leap to believe that Democrats are all Satan, Satan worship, worshiping. The difference is on our side of the house, we force people to be confronted with different perspectives. So even if they don't change their mind, the likelihood of them radicalizing to the uh, far, further away for, uh, from the center is diminished purely because they have that outside perspe uh, perspe perspective and they don't get too certain in their own viewpoint. So even at her worst, in which opposition proved to you that people who are already quite radicalized become even more radicalized, I think that's such a small portion of the, the population. And because we uh, make sure that there are more people who are unable to do so, we win this debate on that. A couple of things in the speech then. 
Firstly, I'm going to rebut the arguments which get from opposition about legitimization and radicalization. Then I'm going to explain why our arguments still stand and why they outweigh opposition in this debate. Firstly, in terms of legitimization, three, uh, three things here. Firstly, they tell you that extreme views are, nor uh, uh, are, uh, are normalized. The problem here is that this is true to an extent, but the problem here is that like, oftentimes CNN and the BBC will already talk about conspiracy theories things like this, no QS, and oftentimes stories about these become politics. Secondly, uh, they talk about radicalization. Two responses here. Firstly, they say that individuals won't watch mainstream news because they become distrustful of the go uh, government. Two things here. Firstly, if this is already true, then that's no difference. So for instance, if I'm already uh, distrustful of the establishment, then I'm also unlikely to want to watch any kind of mainstream uh, stream news because I would see this as part of the est establishment. I don't think there are many QAnon people who are very deep in Fox News. Oftentimes QAnoners and far-right conspiracy theorists are also distrustful of, of Fox News. This is why so many people moved away from Fox News after they, they disapproved of January 6th. But secondly, we argue from first that platforms like Fox News are a gateway to further and further right news sources. Since they did not contest this, we think this claim already doesn't st uh, stand. But thirdly, if this is not about people who are already radicalized, but rather about normal people who don't like government intervention, we think there are two reasons as to why they're unlikely to move uh, for, uh, further away. Firstly, because these sources are generally quite reputable to the average uh, uh, average voter. The BBC is broadly trusted to some extent by the vast majority, uh, majority of especially moderate British people. But secondly, these are also the sources which are mo uh, most accessible. When you Google something online, the first sources that you'll see will be from the most reputable uh, news sources. These uh, these stories will be the ones which people around you will be talking uh, to uh, talking about. But lastly, even if people further radicalize, we think overall we create a healthier and more functional democracy. Why? Because if the what five percent of people who are currently very far down the rabbit hole or incredibly conspiracy theorists move even farther away, that's fine. If at least fifty percent of the population moves closer to the center, where we don't let as much political gridlock as we do in the status quo, where the Republicans and the Democrats are unwilling to concede on absolutely anything. Before I move on, I'll take a POI. Look, the comparative of this debate is the point at which you create more radical people, is the point at which you justify literal hate crimes like you see against Muslim people in Germany or, or like white supremacy in the United States. Please engage. Okay, I, I'm going to explain now, in terms of our own case, why people further polarize on the opposition side of the house. So basically, we say that there are three reasons as to why individuals are less polarized on our side of the house. Firstly, because of normalization. And the opposition is going to say that we rebutted their mechanism about normalization earlier, but here's the difference. On Fox News doesn't oftentimes talk about the actual viewpoints of Democrats, whereas CNN and the BBC often at, at times do, do stories on, for instance, the way that QAnon, uh, QAnoners or anti-vaxxers think. Oftentimes that's the most sensationalist kind of news. However, Fox News and CNN, for instance, are unwilling to show the reasonable side of each other's sto uh, stories because there there's a greater level of fear that your audience will find they're a part of that reasonable, so they'll go away from your own ideological stat stance. So that's why we get more normalization on our side of the at house when it comes to the other side of the aisle. Secondly, we talk about moderation. So here they give a response. They say it's a bad thing when, for instance, Joe Manchin goes on these channels because Joe Manchin will agree with anything, everything that they say. Firstly, this is not true. So if Joe Manchin agrees with Fox News on or whichever host Fox News invites on climate change, there's not really a discussion and it's not really a fair discussion because as our first speaker explains, what the fairness doctrine then means is that controversial big issues within society must be debated from the major perspectives which exist within society. So if Joe Manchin and whoever he'd be debating against on Fox News would both agree that climate change isn't a problem, then that would be an unfair representation uh, representation of the discussion around climate change, for, in for instance. What we mean with moderation is that oftentimes platforms like Fox News will talk about the Democrats as if they're all like AOC or Bernie Sanders or the most far left the Democrats will ever go. Even Sometimes they'll even pretend that they're even farther left. They'll talk about like the Democrats being literally like communists and stuff like, uh, stuff like that. But the problem then is that they can't really do this when you have the fairness doctrine. And the logic behind that's fairly simple. Because there's a greater uh, because there's a greater risk that AOC or Bernie Sanders will sound reasonable to the average Republican voter, uh, voter or the same amount of chances with mo uh, moderates. But the danger then is, is if your starting point is here, if you find yourself agreeing with someone who's way farther away, then the middle point will be farther away than if you find someone who's already kind of at that point. Then you'll be less uh, then you'll be less weighted to the other side. Thirdly and lastly, we talk about humanization, about the uh, degree to which you can see other pe uh, people as actual people instead of like thinking that all the Democrats are like safe and stuff like that. What do they say here? They say a couple of things. 
Firstly, they say that polarization comes from lack of trust in the government and people become more polarized when the government intervenes in media. I've already contested this claim in my rebuttal, but even in our worst case scenario, which people do for a time move away, move away, I think over time people are going to come back as this becomes the new norm in which everyone who watches the, uh, the mainstream media will get used to this so individuals will no longer find this as a government total over overreach. Before I continue, I'd be happy to take a POI. Notice, insofar, why would anyone who has severe distrust of a social system that, that thinks that the state is literally out to get them would ever confide back to the system, which fundamentally they believe is controlling their every thought and their uh, ideas? Yeah. For, for the people that are this extreme, like how many of them are watching mainstream news anyways? Like surely they're already watching uh, news, which is uh, about as far right as them to confirm their, uh, their own viewpoints, platforms like OAN or 4chan or wherever. Secondly, uh, they say that the news is going to be supervised anyways in the questions and things like that that they ask. Firstly, I don't think this is true. I think that the moment in which you ask biased questions or you invite uh, or you invite guests who clearly uh, who clearly do not represent a certain uh, important point on a topic, then that's the moment in time in which the fairness doctrine comes into play and, to, uh, and when the accountability mechanisms for that come in. We say that the media is likely to err on the side of caution. So even if it's unlikely that you will be uh, that you will be stopped for the fairness doctrine, media will do so anyways. Why? Because getting your broadcast license stripped is such an incredibly huge harm to your business, like you literally can no longer operate, that even if it would be more beneficial for you if you could be biased and there's a low chance that you could be caught, you're going to want to err on the side of caution because otherwise you would lose everything. Lastly, they say that people don't like debates, so no one will want to watch this. Firstly, I don't think that's true. If anything, I think that oftentimes debates are more sensationalist than like boring news items. But secondly, I don't think all people watch news to be sensationalist. I think the news which is most sensationalist tends to get the most views. But oftentimes people want to watch the news for reasons which aren't specifically about sensationalism. People want to feel inf uh, infor uh, informed and people want to feel like they have a diverse view of society. So overall, we find it unlikely that people are going to switch off the me media. And even if people who are already far right will go even further right, we find it more important that the average person becomes less polarized, that we can get more done politically the people uh, people feel uh, less hatred towards each other vote prop i thank the prop second for that speech and now to continue the case on opposition welcome the op second yeah 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 hello hi uh i do POI is audibly, so if we are to unmute yourself, say point, something like this. It's best. Yes, Okay. okay, I'll start my speech in three, two, one. At the point at which team proposition fails to analyze and actually impact into this debate, what is the crucial harm of polarization within society when we claim that it is a natural process of the political change that occurs within society? It is a natural process of having disagreement. It is the natural process of, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 of the society being kept in check as for the views that they hold near and dear to their hearts. Because they have never proven those harms and basically their entire case hinge on the increase of polarization, we believe that we have already outframed and won this debate. Debate, I'm incredibly proud to stand side. Um, opposition in my speech will have a few points of refutation and move on to a further argument about how minorities are left out from the public debate and how it is also a crucial agent within this debate that must be analyzed by side proposition okay let me first of all get uh, into the idea of you know people who people getting uh, actually fully informed on their side of the house, getting the best information possible and all of these sorts of ideas. First of all, I believe that this necessarily clashes with their own characterization of how people engage with news media in the first place and what they actually want to see when they themselves bring up the ideas of you know, news having needing to be shocking, needing to be dramatized and all of these points. We're telling you that at the point at which you introduce a sort of like you no know, political show debate into every 
every single new se segment that you must have into every single topic that you discuss, we're telling you what is most likely to happen, the news channels who are going to get the most viewer attention rates, the, the shows which are going to be most successful and will want to do all of these things are actually the ones who are going to have the shocking debates with insults and screams, right? The, the, this is why the people, why people actually found like people, uh, uh, individuals such as no Donald Trump appealing, right? Because of the sort of shocking debate nature that he had, or the be or people like Jordan Peterson, like under the status quo as well, right? We're telling you that this oh, characterization I innately clashes because I don't understand why like debate is necessarily going to get us to the right conclusion. I believe that it's far more likely to be like a sport, like we are having right now, you know, in which there are people who are sort of trying to enjoy it, trying to judge it, trying to you know to uh, to to. to uh, to, to, to analyze it and whatnot, right? This often happens. Then the idea, you know, they say, like, uh, then also they, they, they never, like, concretely deal with the ideas that still news channels are going to have the ability and the freedom to manipulate because of how they can, like, you know, invite the guests that are supposed to be representative, right? Which is going to be far more misleading on their side of the house when you keep inviting Joe Manchin on Fox News as the representative Democrat, right? Because under our side of the house, and what is crucial about the status quo, is that when the vast majority of people watch Fox News, they know, ah, yes, it's the Republican TV channel, right? When they watch CNN, they know, ah, yes, it's the, it's the Democrat TV channel, right? This is like the, the, this is what people mostly understand, right? So you know, the, the, you know wh wh why, how the information is biased. You know whether or not like you can actually engage with this on a fruitful level. Uh, and that's like the vast majority of voters. Uh, 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 that, that, that's how like, like the act, right? Then on, let's talk about on the idea of radicalism and being like, uh, uh, and people who are being radicalized. Opposition, prop proposition brings this idea that now people are going to be forced to be confronted with the views that they don't like. We're telling you that this is also already a clashing characterization because they are being forced to watch those views by the state, which they have already been primed to mistrust by areas such as Fox News itself. And itself. Let's like look at the example that the second opposition speaker, proposition speaker actually brought. He said, after the January 6 attacks, the people walked away from Fox News when Fox News condemned it. This is exactly the point. This is what the fairness doctrine would do. It would actually like a uh, force Fox News to condemn the January 6th riots, which means that people tend to, to then will walk away yeah. from this show, will look for other news sources, right? This is exactly the point when they prove our mechanisms of people actually going into other sources. And what is the crucial harm of this? Because the people are most likely to move to sites like Reddit, sites like Fortune, they're likely to go to YouTube, they're likely to go, you know, to those sites which already conform to their biases. They're likely, you know, to go with the Fox News anchor who also also leaves, you know, the Fox News channel when it implements the fairness doctrine because that's no state censorship, right? It's likely that new news shows would be established like this, right? And we're telling you, at this point, these are the spaces when the self-organization and the recruitment into radical groups happens. This is the place where people actually actively turn violent. This is the place where people actually commit terrorist acts at the end of the day when they're being drawn into these uh, into these wormholes and etc at the point at which you're still able to be conformed to your, your biases on fox news which still has to be relatively moderate at the point at which it wants to appeal to a major conservative audience and wants to attract new voters right we're telling you is a point at which there we have far less violent people on our side of the house right uh, uh, um and then, like, also on the point uh, uh, which I now forgot on, like, uh, you know, the, the the getting the correct information, you know, it often takes like ten minutes to refute a ten-second lie. I think we all know this, like, even from debate experience. You know how hard it is to engage with the other team when they are saying bullcrap. You know, but the, the, then the idea here is that you are never actually able to actively engage, you know, uh, on those news shows on a fully fruitful level at the point at which those shocking and uh, uh, things are happening. I can take the in the status quo as a democrat that goes on cnn you know that your audience already agrees with you but when you go on fox news don't you think you have an incentive to try to convince other people okay no i don't think that like you know 
<laughs> okay, Joe Manchin wouldn't have that incentive. Fox News would never have the incentive to invite such a person, right? And even when this is happening, we're telling you it's far more, it's far less likely to happen, even when like it's put in a discussion format when both views are sort of being uh, uh, held in equal regard. Now, let's look at how media covers realistically in the majority of cases. Major broadcasting channels provide fast, easily consumable news. This looks like in 15 minutes, they have four reporters providing news on like 10 topics. We're telling you that objectively, Objectively covering more sides of the same issue means that more time needs to be spent on each of them, meaning that time now has to be relocated and uh, the, the, the news channels will have to prioritize certain issues over others because they don't have the same capacity to report on everything. The issues prioritized will most likely be mainstream news that are relevant for the majority of people and the minority issues are more likely to be left out due to time constraints. Further on, people who actually engage in social activism, who work for the welfare of other people, People, and like notice who this will also engage with their POI directly, are unlikely to want to debate about their activity. Most serious activists will go on to debate the notion whether black lives actually matter, whether trans people deserve to be seen as people, whether refugees should be let in. They wouldn't warrant such topics as worthy of discussion. Far more likely, the news agencies who just have quotas to fill under the fairness doctrine to check that all the views are fairly represented will invite those who are willing to speak likely to be either people who aren't actually engaged in social causes or opportunists who want to abuse the chance of getting a platform. Comparatively, our sites still allows for the existence of long in-depth interviews with say like a social worker who helps refugees go through the legal process and actually explains what it's like without any need for scrutiny from a nationalist who wants to keep the borders closed. For, closed. for all these reasons, uh, uh, votes team opposition. I thank the opposition second. Now to conclude the substantive portion of prop, welcome the P3. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Be wise in the chat, please. And if I haven't taken one by six minutes, you can make them uh, audibly. Hanno, the status quo is one in which people have literally stormed the capital. It is one in which new governments overturn past policies from other ones, not because they were bad, but in order to differentiate, differentiate themselves from them because they're the enemy. Do not let side opposition get away by saying the status quo is not bad enough, because it is. It is terrible. Something needs to change. Very proud to propose. In a speech, very quickly on the minority arguments, then on their arguments on more radicalization and how they how uh, and on how this reduces in, uh, uh, accountability, and then on how we combat polarization and the final way off. So, firstly, quickly on our minority arguments. Okay, they tell us that time has to be relo uh, relocated and therefore minority news will be cut. Firstly, panel, I think it will not because many things with minorities also, also affect the general public. So, for example, when BLM strikes, that is relevant for everyone because that is something that is, for example, going on in your city. But secondly, even, even if that would not be the case, I also do not think that it would be the case on the comparative because I think the group that will not know about minorities will not know that about them either shy because of the speech we generally just see in the world. If anything, we have more representation for minorities because when we do report on them, we have to show both sides of the issue. Now, let's get into the more important stuff in this debate than the one minute argument of side opposition. What have they told us? They firstly brought us an argument on how we re uh, reduce accountability. They basically told us that shows will only invite to right wing people, for example, and that with that, you create a sense of legitimacy because the fairness doctrine is still there. Panel, firstly, no. Why will this not happen? Note that we set up a model in which news uh, broadcasts would be penalized at the moment that they do this. They're more likely to want to err on the safe side because you're you are getting penalized too often, you literally can lose your license. That is a huge risk to dare you take, therefore you want to err on the safe side and not invite two uh, Republican speakers. I think that is simply very unlikely. But secondly, note that this is literally the motion. I think we have some fear to actually have like this let's, uh, opposition debates that people have to actually represent the 
other side as well. I think they're just not debating the motion with this. It's you're getting penalized for it. We simply have the fiat. But thirdly, even if that would not be the case, uh, even if it would be the case that you have two right wing people and it has a sense of legitimacy, note that there's also a sense of legitimacy and a, in the status quo. They tell you that Fox viewers do not know that they are get, uh, know that they're getting biased media. I think that that is inherently untrue. For example, there was this research conducted in which Fox News viewers got to, had to watch CNN for an entire month. After that month, many of them shifted their views for example, on the relation with the Democratic Party, with police, for example, showing that they actually did change their views because they were not aware of the bias that Fox News had, and they did not inform themselves more. So I think this falls. Secondly, tell us, yeah, but you normalize more extreme views by talking more about them and that that is very bad. Look, Panel. Firstly, showing both sides doesn't require you to promote fringe viewpoints. That's not what this debate is about. So when you're talking about pro-vaxxers, you don't necessarily have to invite people to think the government is a scam, the people that, for example, think the vaccine is scary because it was made so fast. But secondly, even if the media, even if that is the case, if the media normally doesn't report this unreliable information, it now has to, to quite inform viewers that will they will not believe these fringe views as they're already quite informed, so it's largely unprepared. But thirdly, even if this is the case, it's a good thing. Firstly, it provides a good stage for constructive discussion in which fringe views can be deconstructed, so fewer people are likely to believe them. Secondly, media that normally promote these fringe views also have to invite opposing speakers, meaning that if you're not able to defend yourself well, you will lose support. Note that the way that people become extremists is not by hearing a few fringe view once. It's by getting in an echo chamber of that fringe view and hearing very little opposition. We get people out of those echo chambers on side proposition by hearing, letting them hear other views as well. So we do not reduce inequality argument false. Their second argument on how they have more radicalization, they basically tell us is that people will go to other forms of media. Sam already gave you quite some responses as to why there are reasons for news consumers to still uh, uh, continue to uh, with uh, consuming traditional news sources. For example, that's more accessible and reputable, but note that's also just habit to do so. But secondly, even if consumers do leave, the quality of other sources improves. Small websites don't have the resources for their own teams of journalists, so they tend to base their stories on reporting from big broadcasters. Since we improve the quality of reporting there, these websites will also become less problematic. But thirdly, even if consumers leave and they leave to sources that are significantly worse, that is a problem that exists in the short term at best. We explained why the audience becomes less polarized over the long term. Therefore, they will not be as offended by balanced news reporting. Then it brings us the point on that people that are anti-establishment will radicalize further. Firstly, I think the uh, um, and the Ferris doctrine is separate of who is in office. But secondly, it works both ways. This means that you also have to critique, for example, the office at the moment that they do something bad. So I don't believe this. I think they have insufficiently explained how people radicalize further in their societies. The case falls. I'll take a PY now. On your side, how would a discussion on giving trans people rights look like without platforming a transphobic person? Look, I think at the moment that you platform a transphobic person, you put someone actually feel actual feelings uh, 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 across them. I think that is the moment that people are likely to uh, to believe the person that is arguing for people's actual rights because you see their face, you see their emotions. You're actually putting a real human being uh, across to that. Okay, then now what did we tell you on our side of the house? We told you how we combat polarization. We gave you three reasons why inherent why this inherent free media that it is polarizing. So that all Opposition tells us, yeah, but that proves why people want shocking debates. Look, the reason why this is the case is because there is a race to the bottom. Media constantly needs to compete for people's attention. That is terrible because that way media reporting constantly becomes worse and worse. We told you why three terrible things happen because of that. Firstly, there's increased hostility because you simply think the other side is the enemy. We told you why there's a political gridlock, why it means that politicians are unwilling to find common ground because they constantly feel the need to differentiate themselves from one another. We told you why democratic backsliding is easier to happen on side opposition at the moment that this critique is not necessary. That is terrible. We prevent many of these impacts actually from happening. Well, at least we make it a lot better at the moment that we give people more viewpoints. Because firstly, it means that you're likely to actually humanize the other side. 
side. Know that you see their faces. Know that you hear the motivations for the viewpoints they have. So for example, the example I earlier gave on people that are anti-vax, I think that they're not necessarily terrible people for being anti-vax at the moment that you're just scared. You don't know what is going on and, you're th and you think that you might be putting something very scary into your body. I think that moment is very important to have the constructive debate, to tell people why they shouldn't have to be scary, why it's all going to be all right. I think that is the moment that people grow closer towards each other, the moment that we get a less polarized society where people are simply nicer to each one another at the moment that politics becomes less polarized. Okay, then in the way of, once again, do not let side opposition get away with saying that it's not that big of an issue and that polarization isn't that bad because it's terrible. It's affecting everyone in the world all across the globe. I think on uh, even if they prove that uh, that there's like even if they prove some harms of their side of the um, their side of the house, maybe that maybe some people go to other forms of media or that they will believe this is another hoax of the government. I'm very unsure why those people aren't very radical in the first place to begin with because I think they're too far gone on either side of the house. Why is our impact on more important. Firstly, short term, long term. There may be some backlash on the short term, but on the long term, this is a new normal, meaning that people adapt and therefore on the long term, people are willing to accept that this is a new new and therefore don't become as radical to begin with. But secondly, the number of people who are not going to respond uh, positive is quite small. We get the majority. People that have actual political and societal power can actually make a change. For all those reasons, never been prouder to propose. I thank the P3, now to conclude the substantive for prop and the substantive portion of the debate. Welcome the O3. Yeah, hello. Firstly, can, am I audible? Yes, perfectly fine. Okay. Uh, yeah, my pronouns he, him. I'd like my POIs in the chat, please. Yeah, so just uh, write it and I'll uh, see it and just I'll start my speech in just a few seconds. Okay, I'll start. Uh, I'll start my speech in three, two, one. Panel proposition asks us why should we care about radicals getting more radical? This is because every new radical person is likely to be a lone wolf attack on the black community. It is likely to be a hate crime on a Muslim community in France. It is likely to be bigotry to the migrants in Germany. We reject this cold and heartless narrative from proposition. If polarization is so horrible, then hate crimes and radicalization, then outright violence is even worse. In my speech, two clash points. Firstly, is the fairness doctrine fair, right? And secondly, which side solves the polarization and radicalization? Right, but just a quick strategic oh, note. Right, like notice how generally all of their analysis is only contingent on the United States. Right, notice how this is important because the majority of functioning democracies in the world have actually pluralistic systems. Right, this means that they have a few parties, and therefore for opposition to you know for proposition to actually show all of the sides, they would have to platform from from all the different parties, fundamentally increasing the complexity, increasing the boringness, and generally just decreasing, uh, uh, like just making it more complicated. Something we never engage with, right? But let's talk about the first clash point: is the fairness doctrine fair? Look, let's talk. Let's just know, think about this logically. What will be the people who they are likely to invite? Right? A. It is likely to be someone with. Uh, at least minimal power imbalance, someone to mock and make it more entertaining, because generally just think that these, uh, like if their, if their characterization of media networks being so profit driven, being so wanting to be sensationalist and all of that stuff, then they're, what is the incentive for them for like Blaze to not invite Ben Shapiro and then as a counterbalance to just get like a radical feminist college student who he, he can destroy and therefore just seem so much more effective to the general uh, observers, right? But secondly, even if they will invite someone to, who satisfies their ideology similarly, for instance, right? Look, let's take a very simple example, something that has been running through this case. If a Democrat-sponsored Green New Deal is being debated in the United States Senate, 
why wouldn't conservative outlines just deny a Republican like Ted Cruz and then Joe Manchin as a counterbalance because he's someone who comes from a different uh, party, right? That's literally their own mechanism that they said in their like first speech that uh, like, for example, in Italy, people come from different political parties, right? What we tell you is that since the spread of ideas is so far, right? They, they cannot just simply uh, not engage with the fact that these networks are likely to still push their own ideas. But let's talk about the format a bit, right? Right? Because we generally say that, oh, all of these will be debates, right? Because this is a bit uh, like, and generally will be just discussion, right? This is crucial because people like, like, why do people watch news? Because that's something what opposition, what opposition never really characterizes, right? The reason why someone turns on CNN is because it's really fun to see them dunking on Ted Cruz. And the same is the reason why we watch Daily Mirror, right? Because destroying Boris Johnson about painting red trucks is really, really fun, right? They aren't really that interested in watching a debate. Why is that a crucial characterization? It means that they are less interested and less incentivized to be interested in politics insofar as we don't actually watch the news, right? As they fundamentally don't see the minimal enjoyment that we got there, right? By that definition, they're way less likely to be politically active. And they, for example, with voters are already low, right? Insofar as they fundamentally decrease the interest in politics, that is a net harm on their side of the house. But let's talk about our side because this one totally unengaged, right? Because look, what do you tell you? A, we literally told you that everything that is brought is perceived as a possible truth. Never engage, right? This is incredibly harmful because it says that some questions can be discussed. It raises a question that, for example, the uh, rights of people, or right, the rights of que uh, queer individuals, the rights of like trans athletes are something discussable, right? But more importantly, right? Notice how this normalizes bigotry, right? Your only response to this ever was that, oh, they will just talk it about it on both sides of the, uh, on, bo on their side, on both uh, perspectives, right? But look at the comparative. On their side of the house, they platform people uh, that uh, they platform most people and allow them a voice. On our side of the house, we just have the sun dunking on, Bell Dick, on Mel Gibson for being anti-Semitic, right? It's so much less likely that anti-Semitic ideas will be spread on our side of the house, the point at which the anti-Semitic people don't actually have any sort of outlet, right? Notice how this is independent of their model because they will have to invite these people to provide like a counter alternative because by their own definition, right? If they cannot invite Joe Manchin because he isn't a radical enough of a difference, right? You cannot just invite two people who both agree on, on like uh, uh, trans rights, right? But look, well, like, uh, let's talk about like, let's look, where are you more likely to be misinformed? Let's take a look at best case scenarios of both sides of the house, because once again, never done that on their side of the house. Like on their side, you just watch a debate and get intelligent, right? Let's, let's, let's assume that. On our side of the house, as if you're still an undecided voter, right? What you likely do is that since you know that, for example, Fox News is biased, but you know that CNN is also biased, you're likely to still look at both of them and you just craft your own narrative. Why is this more important? Because look at, there's this thing called elaboration likelihood, right? There's two roots of processing uh, thought, right? Something uh, that is peripheral, something that happens on our side of the house is that when you hear Fox News, you don't retain it because you know that that information is biased in a certain side, but on their side of the house, their thinking is active, right? Insofar as you see a debate and you automatically craft a narrative because you think that you know both sides of the coin, insofar as we prove to you that both sides of the coin are actually not uh, the true sides, we take this point, right? Before moving on to the second flash one, I'll gladly take up your why. In the status quo, Fox News already gives platforms to openly racist individuals. Don't you think the difference in okay. our world is at least able to debate these individuals? Look, panel. Uh, this is directly leads to uh, the second attachment. Which side falls polarization and radicalization, right? We talk to you that you see other people as human, right? This is important because notice how all of their analysis on that can be extended to, be, to people just watching a racist debate and then say, oh, maybe the racist person also has some sort of a point. He does seem human, right? He does have a family that he cares and maybe he's just concerned about uh, the increased crime, right? But secondly, right? There's like, look that there is generally, uh, like the, the way we say it is that you will just invite moderates, right? But this is literally no change from the status quo, right? He literally squirreled this debate because like Joe Manchin is the most common Democrat on Fox News. They, they, uh, they, trip, uh, they trip over themselves, right? You say that this would be unfair representation, but their own model says that we people will come from different political parties, right? But now let's talk about polarization, because what we never understand is that polarization doesn't just land from Fox News. 
It is natural in politics, right? We never explain to you why would Biden not call Trump racist? Why would this sort of language, why this toxic sort of language, would not be shown, would not be shown like uh, on public debates or anything like that, right? Polarization in itself is likely to happen uh, on either way. But look, status quo may not be perfect, but why is proposition so much horrible? Because what, what did we tell you? We told you that the point at which you literally uh, your entire life have been uh, have been slowly being introduced by your family, by just general uh, uh, media into the idea that maybe the state is not uh, the, the uh, optimal agent. The point at which we say, oh, we will endorse, we will show to you what is fair, is the point at which you're unlikely to ever come back to that network again, is the point at which you're likely to move to other movements, right? But this is crucial because notice that we never engage with our actual uh, second or third argument because what happens on our side of the house is that the people that they will be platforming on these uh, individual on these uh, Ternas doctrines, right? They're not going to be uh, individuals who, for example, support uh, Palestine because those people see this as a scam, right? What's likely to be that those will be people who are just searching for out, meaning that their ideas will never be represented and minorities are going to be with individuals so I'm incredibly proud to oppose. I think the O3, that concludes the substantive portion of the debate. And now we move on to the team's concluding reply speeches. And I welcome the reply speech. Yeah, the up reply. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, wait, am I audible? Oh, okay. The microphone doesn't have the, the green, it doesn't move on it, the sound, whatever. Um, okay. I'll start my speech in three, two, one. The first thing I would like to clarify within my speech is to sort of look at this debate and try to understand how both teams conceptualized what, like, how do people engage with the news? What is the the reason behind people watching the news and why do we do it? Because I think that the primary analysis that was brought by side proposition and the characterizations they want to make makes their world fundamentally unclear as to how the new the fairness doctrine would actually look like. Because at the point at which they say that already under the status quo, shocking and sensational news is being rewarded and the sort of race to the bottom is constantly occurring and that's how news sort of operates. It's unclear to us, then are people actually engaging with the news through the lens of wanting and like trying to be like informed, of actually like seeking out uh, political uh, discussion and ideology so that they could, uh, uh, so that they could actually like know, uh, think of themselves as being enlightened and knowing much more than any other or something like this, you know? But what we say is that most of these people who watch most of these shows already through the sense of, you know, like after work having like, you know, during lunchtime or whatever, right? We're telling you they are not watching it as a way of getting informed. Far more likely they're watching it as like a way to keep the illusion of being informed and of getting there confirmation bias like being engaged right we're telling you that the people who would then want to watch the debates on their side of the house would still want them to be sort of like a sports match sort of like a political debate in which you know the commentary afterwards goes like this oh i think he was a very confident speaker he it, it seemed that he knew what he was talking about uh the other one seemed a little bit you no know, squirrely or whatever uh, uh something like this you know after like the political debates happen often you see this, right? We're telling you that the, the, like, like, uh, the fairness doctrine would still make the news essentially as ineffective as in, uh, in informing people, and we've proved this in many ways. But secondly, like the people who are in the sort of middle way, the people who would actually seek and want to be informed, that sort of watch and scrutinize these shows, right now on their side of the house, would be presented with debates under the illusion of fairness and fair fairness already existing and that it's not the thing that they need to search for themselves via research, via scrutiny, and etc. We're telling you that it's far more likely that these people then would be sort of brainwashed on their side of the house, right? Because 
of how because when they are already searching uh, searching for scrutinize they know that when they watch fox news it's a republican channel right then let me go into the distinction of polarization and radicalization also because it seemed, it seemed throughout this debate that proposition treats those two concepts as exactly the same thing right because like let's look at the capital rioters it was not like political pol polarization which caused the uh, mass reaction of violence no it was radicalization right and notice how it was already born out of a narrative of perceived state involvement in the election process and they, like they are hindering it, etc. Right? We're telling you that the people who have been radicalized along these lines and polarization is fundamentally different because polarization can happen across many different lines across society, which do not necess necessitate them to be radical polarization. Right? We're telling you that the source of people who are actually the most important agents in the context of radicalization within this debate would be far more radicalized, would be pushed into far more. Uh, uh, echo chambers on their side of the house because of the way that we have characterized them and how proposition has never refuted it. For these reasons, I beg you to oppose. I thank the up reply. Now to conclude both the prop bench and the whole debate, welcome the prop reply. Hi, hi. Am I still audible? Yes. Great. Okay. The proposition push has been very simple since the start. This is a debate about echo chambers. Side proposition is the side which breaks the echo chambers for the vast majority of people. I want to put this way up, up at the front. Even if there are more people who are going to go to 4chan, that is unfortunate. Whereas, it's, however, it's unlikely that the vast majority of people will leave traditional news media for all the reasons that we gave you in our speeches. Therefore, sure, there are certain people who are likely to already be radicalized who will become slightly more radicalized. But the more important change is that we break the echo chambers which the vast majority of voters in the status quo exist in. I'm going to do two things in this debate. Firstly, I'm going to acknowledge the K-ship which happens in third op and respond to it. Then secondly, I'm going to talk about the main thrust for the vast majority of this debate, the debate about polarization. So firstly, in terms of the third opposition speech, the vast majority of the third opposition speech is specifically about minority representation in, me in media. This content is not new. However, it does suddenly become the most important impact in the debate. A couple of things here. Firstly, in terms of the points of minorities in, new uh, in news, which is brought up in seven opposition, just a quick observation here. This is brought up in the last minute of the second op uh, opposition and then completely dropped in the third opposition speech. But secondly, note that our speaker also engages with this and explains why on our side of the house, we uniquely get more minority representation in the news. So sure, we might cover less stories, but those stories are more likely to feature the representation of minority views. But their second point was about bigotry specifically in the news. So for instance, that you'd have to have transphobes or, raci uh, or racists. Firstly, I don't think they ever really explain why that's likely to be such a controversial issue, especially given that the vast majority of people aren't necessarily uh, explicitly racist. I think it's more likely that you're going to have discussions about, for instance, BLM, but not about whether or not, like, for instance, but black people deserve rights. But a couple of conservative points here. Firstly, Note that we explained that this is also about echo chambers, that there will be, for instance, platforms like Fox News, which will have exclusively transphobic people on either side of the house. So these, uh, these kinds of ideas will exist either way. But secondly, we explain why it's only on our side of the house that we're more able to deconstruct these ideas. And in addition to that, also note we give a unique mechanism for this in speech. The individuals who are bigoted are acting off of hate and it's easier to humanize the individuals who are fighting for the rights of others that's why someone who's fighting for gay rights is likely to be more persuasive than someone who's fighting against it thirdly and lastly on weighing which is what they never do here they say it is bad for a minority to hear a trans or a trans person to hear a transphobic person in the news but we also flag that it's bad for a trans person to not have any trans representation in the news since they never do weighing between these groups we think this is the best awash for them but secondly in terms of the more important question in the debate about polarization. There are two groups here. The first is what proposition focuses on. It's about people who are explicitly radical conspiracy theorists already. And the second group is about literally everyone else in society. Firstly, about conspiracy theorists. I'm going to do some weighing up front so I can contribute, contribute to this directly before I go into evaluating the, the, the 
lack of here. Three points of weighing for the group of conspiracy theorists. Firstly, these people are pretty far gone already. Sure, they might go further, uh, fur, uh, further to the right or further to the left, but it's unclear how exactly you create a massive delta there, where previously they were unlikely to, for instance, commit a school shooting. However, now they are more likely. Secondly, in terms of scale, yes, it's a bad thing when there are more people radicalized, but the amount of people who are currently radicalized, as we already flag in every single speech, is so incredibly marginal. The 80% of society or more, which has now changed from our side of the house, massively outweighs it in terms of skill. Thirdly, and lastly, the, uh, the way in which opposition never engages about short term versus long term. Maybe in the short term, we create more radicalized individuals, whereas uh, over time, as society adapts, we get increasingly lit uh, amounts of conspiracy theories. So, on the long term, we also win. Note, their analysis here is that people are scared of the government, but our analysis here is that people are scared of the government because currently they exist in echo chambers, which only push them farther away. But secondly, but everyone else. All they say here is that people will will stop watching the news because it will become too boring without firstly ever establishing why it would be boring, but secondly, rebutting the incentives for people not to go and leave the news that we give in mind and on line of spe speech, that people want to be informed and that the these are the most accessible news sources that you hear around you. Overall, because of issues like getting policy passed, issues like making sure that there aren't, for instance, BLM rights or anti-BLM rights are important, you should vote for opposition a proposition. Thank the proper reply for that speech and indeed everyone for what was an enjoyable debate. Oh, sorry.